And now Talk Catholic with Tim Kilcoyne, a show about faith and other teachings. TalkCatholic.com with Tim Kilcoyne. It is first Saturday, and we will continue on with our interview of Dr. Mark Rolo. But don't forget those first Saturday fulfillments of Our Lady's promise to take care of you. If you'll go to Mass on five consecutive first Saturdays, go to confession beforehand, and meditate on one of the mysteries of the Rosary, and offer up some work of charity or prayer intention in particular, For us today, don't we need it? And in that light, the time is ever apropos relative to some issues of serious concern down in the State House. I had mentioned that July 31st was coming around the corner, and that was an initial deadline for movement on these. Uh, I spoke to the doctor on the phone just the other day, and he told me that uh, there was no uh, motion forward. Uh, However, they could continue to sneak it through, especially up until December 31st. I think we need to continue to be informed with some of the natural law arguments simply because those are the only ones that they're going to listen to down at the state house and i have the doctor here again with us today to continue on uh in that pursuit we're looking at some of the natural law arguments pertaining to abortion and or euthanasia down at the state house because we have to concede uh that they're not able Uh, apparently, as uh, civil servants, uh, to engage in the theological orientation on these matters. So with that being uh, kind of an accepted concession, what would be, first of all, what is natural law, Doc, and how do you proceed uh, relative to the argumentation in support of human life? Right. Well, of course, uh, I'm a physician, not a philosopher. Or (laughs) My own simple-minded notion of uh, natural law is probably, in many cases, be boiled down to the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Very good. And um, so I try to use that kind of uh, argumentation as they, a lot of the uh, people in the legislature are not particularly religious. Uh, some are atheists, no, some are agnostics. And, might, uh, might, might we uh, assume that over 50% might be the number on what you're talking about here? Well, that would be my own impression. Yes. Okay, uh, yeah. Don't have any hard facts to back that up, but just uh, yeah. Would it be your impression that it could be significantly more than fifty percent? Uh, I would think so. Wow, yeah. amazing! But, but it's hard. It's hard to say. And of course, yeah. um, you know, people have a different you know view of what it is to be religious. You know, people like to say they're not formally religious, but they're spiritual. Of course, right, know, right. Never quite that means, but, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, you know, we live in a we, we live in a very um, diverse society with right. uh, diverse opinions on everything, including religion. So I try to stick to um, secular arguments, and our, the secular arguments that are out there are all based on our uh, Christian Judeo Christian tradition. They right. may not may not know it, yeah. But but I still think that that's still the case that we that our heritage is a Judeo-Christian. And, there, and, and may I simply say that, you know, therefore, the Ten Commandments <laughs> would, would so represent, uh, you know, the bulk or heart of that jurisprudence that one, at least in former times, uh, would have been more than knowledgeable of as one would go through law school. And now we're tearing down the Ten Commandments in courtrooms. Um, so that represents a serious break with just American jurisprudence, no? Yes, and that well, that and that kind of gets back to the whole natural law um, idea that that uh, people may physically not want to see the Ten Commandments uh, on the wall of a of a courtroom. Mm. But we all know that our laws are ultimately based on on uh, things like the Ten Commandments. Right. Nobody's it's okay to go out and murder somebody. Right. Nobody, nobody is going to say it's okay to go out and steal. Right. Uh, no one's going to say that it's right to want to, you know, uh, take something from your neighbor. Right. Uh, I won't uh, bring it back to the uh, Ten Commandments, but still, that that basic uh, culture uh, questions are still out there. And do you um, do you find uh, in your own walk, okay, in, in your own everyday walk? Because I, I certainly find this to be the case uh, in, in so many places, that there are many out there who live, I you know, quote unquote, conservative lifestyles, and yet they will support highly liberal causes. Can you right. give ex- give some give some uh, elucidation to that? <laughs> well, I think most 
uh, live their lives uh, conservatively, uh, even though we've tried to uh, destroy the language, uh, say, for instance, on, on uh, same-sex marriage or same-sex so-called marriage. Right. Even though that's kind of out there, that broad of the definition, most people, you know, live their lives as husband and wife with children and, and that basic... Uh, no, you know, nuclear building. family. Yeah, the, the nuclear family. And, yeah. And uh, it's always been... Um, you know, the building block of, uh, of any society is, is uh, the family. So even as we try to break down the family, or even as some people try to uh, break down the family, such as the, you know, the radical left, the, um, the, the Marxists who want to um, break down the family so mm. as to exert more control over the culture. Right. Uh, even, even as that uh, goes on, most people... Uh, have an ideal, whether they verbalize it or not, of um, of uh, a man and a woman together raising children, wanting right. what's best for their children, wanting what's best for their neighborhood, wanting what's best for their country. Right. Uh, living these are these are all things um, that most people still believe. The model that built, certainly built America that was rooted in our Holy Mother Church. That's right. I, I'm thinking of a book as you're talking of uh, Truth Overruled by Ryan T. Anderson, uh, who it, the whole book is basically on, on natural law. And I can <laughs> remember a quote from that saying, you know, uh, when you have to explain what marriage is, it's like trying to explain that the wheels are round. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, really amazing. But, um, but, you know, what I'm worried about is that there is a movement in the political discourse towards a kind of laissez-faire libertarianism, as we want to call it, okay, uh, which basically says, you know, you may, you may live your life in a most frugal and highly conservative sort of way, uh, but you just don't want anybody in your bedroom, quote-unquote, you don't want any discourse relative to, to quote unquote private matters, uh, you know, as as uh, some of the political pundits of old, uh, one most popular, uh, would have said, I, I just don't care about you know your bedroom, and yeah. this this is, in my opinion, at the heart of what what would be called the devil's snare of getting good Christian Catholics into that uh, semantic trap of thinking that they can justify uh, your freedom to do whatever you want, uh, but just don't interfere with me. Right, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's human nature, unfortunately, and it's as old as the Garden of Eden. You know? <laughs> okay. You know, the, the Adam and Eve, they, they wanted to do what they wanted, and the devil told them, you know, God can't uh, tell you what to do. You can be your own God. Yes. Uh, and of course, as they and of course, Adam was kind of sitting and watching. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's what I, I found. The Larry Richards made the comment one time. What was Adam doing while he was biting the apple? He had his mouth shut and he was watching. <laughs> but yeah, you know, which, which, which points in the direction of fatherly leadership on all of these issues, on these moral matters, and that's we'll take that up later. But let's uh, take a, you know, give us a little flavor of some of the natural law argumentation, um, you know, specifically uh, regarding the, let's take abortion as example. Um, you know, what, what might be a starting point in trying to convince these people? Well, I, I think uh, one, one way to approach it is that, uh, first of all, abortions uh, don't happen in the bedroom. Going back to that previous uh, argument, mm. they like them, uh, don't, you know, don't, the other thing is, uh, don't tell me what I should do uh, with my own body. Right, right. But that was the, the devil's obvious. biggest victory, right there. Yeah, well, and, and the <laughs> obvious impact to that is that, you know, while the the unborn is not your body, the unborn exactly. is a separate uh, individual. Yeah. Once you're talking about the right of another person, and it's and it's uh, in our Declaration of Independence that we have the right to life, liberty, and and the uh, pursuit of happiness. And if you don't have life, you can't, you, you don't have freedom, and you can't pursue happiness. And uh, the right to life uh, is more and more obviously uh, something that occurs um, in utero and and uh, at conception. And, right. Uh, if the uh, culture likes to say, "Well, I believe in in uh, science, not not religion." Well, of course, that's 
that's uh, they're not mutually exclusive. No, our faith is supported by empirical evidence. We're all in favor of it. Correct, you know, correct. Even with regard to the the, the moment of conception. Exactly, and, and people are so wedded to the notion of, oh no, I want to hear about science, not religion. Well, it's scientifically true. <laughs> That a different life with different DNA begins uh, at conception. Yeah, yeah. They ought to be protected, and uh, and so you you know you, you kind of use the language of the culture, which uh, is all about science, and you say, well, it's I, 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 Doc, I wonder whether it's all about science as a, as opposed to all about me. Um, I'm thinking of you know you're trying to present an argumentation that's based on what we call the sanctity of life ethic, and that is no doubt coming from our perspective as basic Judeo-Christian, but they're coming from this new so-called quality of life ethic. Can you shed some light on the differences there? Well, the, 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 the whole notion of the quality of life gets to the question of, well, who's doing the judgment? Yes. And, and uh, once you fall into that trap of uh, who's judging whose life is uh, of quality and whose life is not does not have any quality, and you're 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 treading on dangerous uh, ground because you're you're ultimately saying that there's somebody out there in in the uh, culture, um, in the uh, legislature or other places, that are they're putting themselves in a position of saying whose life is worth living. Exactly. And that's exactly that, that's exactly you know why that's the first sentence of the first paragraph of our Declaration of Independence that that our rights don't come from legislatures who who make a determination whose life is worth living and whose isn't. Our rights come from God. Indeed. Uh, Those basic rights of life, liberty, and the uh, uh, pursuit of of happiness. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking uh, of uh, theologically, in my own education going back to the 70s, I, I was comparing and contrasting some old moral theology books from old, i.e. some of the books that my mom and dad had at Regis and Holy Cross College back in the 40s with uh, the stuff <laughs> that I had at BC in the late 70s. And you could see the radical shift from a principle-oriented ethic to virtually thoroughly subjective and situation uh, oriented and one of the great victories uh, for the pro choices well first of all the semantic uh, phrase pro choice there there was the victory right there that somehow this has more to do with uh, a person's decision and as you would say they want to focus on who's making these decisions as opposed to what's at stake and what is the empirical reality of this little baby uh, the, uh, the 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 dramatic uh, change uh, in in just the way we do ethics, uh, again, looking at things uh, from, you know, what is the principle at stake and has it been violated? In this particular case, the principle is the right to life, that everyone has it from cradle to grave. Uh, and what they're doing is taking a look at the quality of life. And, and for instance, I think one, you know, so often, you know, the evil one is always looking for a half truth or something that can grab and tug at your apron strings. And this business uh, that somehow everybody would never want a child if they came into this world through rape or incest, okay? And so they would use these very, uh, as we would call them, uh, bookshelf cases. You know, they're fairly rare situations, but they have a compelling rationale to them. Nevertheless, it is not the church's teaching uh, that under any situation, uh, the taking of innocent human life is warranted. Uh, but that's a pretty good example uh, of how things have radically shifted to the subjective and the situational. And I assume that that's where most of the people that you're trying to educate are coming from. Yeah. This is WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. Well, you know, to, to some extent, you got to use their own, um, you got to hoist them on their own petard. And, uh, yeah. You know, they- come at you with situational ethics. Uh, for instance, a good example these days is the whole notion of uh, Black Lives Matter. Okay. And, and when when they come out with that, and I, I recently was having a conversation with a with a, uh, a pastor who, ha- who happened to be black, and, and he was really offended by the phrase Black Lives Matter. He told me, he says, I'll tell you what, that unborn Black Lives Matter. Mm. And uh, so when when people try to, you know, kind of suggest that 
some lives are worth more than others. They did to say black lives matter. Well, of course, black lives matter, and especially unborn black lives. And and getting back to abortion, you can point out that the majority or a disproportionate number of abortions occur uh, in in people of uh, color. And this was what Margaret Sanger had in mind when yes. she. Planned Parenthood, she wanted to get rid of human weeds. Who are the human weeds? Huh. Blacks yeah. and other minorities. In mm. fact... That's who Hitler was looking to for his manual, no? Well, right. And, and uh, Margaret Sanger worked with uh, with uh, Hitler, or at least he worked with uh, the German uh, eugenicists. Yeah. She, she worked with them, and, and she applied some of her eugenic notions to uh, Planned Parenthood. And, it's, and it, it's interesting that just this past week, Planned Parenthood in Manhattan, I think. They're both uh, Margaret Sanger. Wow. And um, so, you know... You, you, They're really coming out in the open, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, to uh, seize on, on uh, things like that and say, yes, well, you're acknowledging that, that uh, Planned Parenthood is not only um, uh, killing uh, life, it, it's uh, it's doing it in a eugenic sort of a way. Right. Uh, it's... They're acting in a way that black lives don't matter. <laughs> right, so, exactly. So people uh, uh, in our culture, like you were saying before, they want to they want to do what they want to do. Nobody can tell them what to do. But exactly. They have to, but but they, the the culture also values uh, egalitarianism. Yes. Treated equally, and if you can point out, well. Well, abortion it does not affect people uh, equally. It disproportionately, disproportionately affects uh, people of color. The same thing with the other death uh, issue, the physician-assisted suicide. Yes. It is the it is the poor, the people of color, yeah. the people with disabilities. They are the ones who are going to be disproportionately affected, as we were talking about uh, last time because um, they are the people who are less likely to have the means to um, get medical care. Right. Because people who do have the means to get medical care, they will take care of themselves if they want to and they want the government or and the and the and medicine uh, to take their lives for them. Right. Uh, but the but the people who don't have the resources um, who are going to be denied by by uh, Medicaid and are going to be denied by insurance companies, they are the ones that are going to suffer. So when I, you know, speak to legislators, those are the arguments I like to, to make, that you're not being fair to everybody. That, right. That it's a question of solidarity versus selfishness. Yes, yes. And also, from you know, getting down to real nitty-gritty uh, basic logic, think of your grandfather and grandmother, you know, and who, and, and who you love. And the quality and care and concern that they showed towards you over the life spectrum, i.e., within the context of a good, healthy family structure. You know, now that they have reached their elderly years, does that somehow rob them of of of, of usefulness? E- even you know, many people that have had uh, physical challenges of any kind uh, amongst their children uh, will all tell you that they were the greatest gift that they could have been given to their family because it taught them how to love. And these kind of arguments speak to what we mentioned in a prior show about the loss of a cradle-to-grave uh, perspective. Because you would think that these politicians that they are, regardless, they have some family of some kind, and the idea that we're going to subject the elderly, in, in the case of euthanasia, to a complete utilitarian ethic, uh, they're not useful anymore, so let's get them, move them out, yeah. move them out yeah. and move them on, uh, yeah. is no different when you think uh, of the abortion issue uh, relative to what I called a developmental theory of killing, where just because you're not as developed <laughs> today as you were yesterday, that somehow you're, you've been robbed of your personhood. I find it amazing that they would not seriously see the common sense uh, of that kind of rationale. Well, and it, it, it's just that sort of argument that did work on, on one uh, legislator who was uh, uh, getting back to the physician-assisted suicide. She mm-hmm. was favored because her reasoning was, well, as you said before, um, people should be able to do what they want with their own body. But when, she, when it was pointed out to her that the elderly are being pushed into this, and, and she thought of her own mother, this particular legislator, yeah. that uh, she didn't want the uh, uh, elderly the, to be, uh, el- there's about 10% of our elderly are 
at risk for elder abuse as it is, mm. you have a law that uh, creates, that drives a wedge and says that you, you can have two witnesses, and one of the witnesses can be an heir huh. uh, to, you know, to... Uh, to the complicating elder. matters a hundredfold. <laughs> yeah, so, so that you know, so she that was one that was how she uh, decided not to push for physician assisted suicide. I see. She didn't want the uh, elderly people being uh, pushed in that uh, uh, direction to be uh, you know manipulated in, in that uh, direction. Right. So these are the you know these are the kinds of natural law sorts of arguments that we have a both with a suicide and, and with abortion. What you're really uh, laying forth for us, it has everything to do with the mind. I'm reminded of some books by uh, our evangelical sister, uh, Joyce Myers, uh, The Battlefield of the Mind. But in this particular book I have here, and it's called Catholics Wake Up by Jesse Romero, late Catholic evangelist, I just want to uh, share a couple of excerpts. He says... Remember that your mind controls every single one of your actions. Your mind controls your thoughts. Your mind tells your body what to do. You speak what's on your mind. Your mind tells your eyes what to look at and your ears things to pay attention to and what things to tune out. Your mind is integral to the way you respond in every single situation. The battle being waged by Satan against you is designed to take control of your mind. Because if Satan can control your mind, he can influence your heart. Your marching orders are to renew your mind through prayer, a life of virtue, and practicing your Catholic faith. We have to make a conscious effort to surrender our entire life to our Lord. That means giving Jesus is complete control over your body, heart, soul, and mind. In order to do this, you must stay in contact with Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You should run everything by Jesus. When you are deciding what to watch on TV, ask Jesus his opinion. When you're choosing which friends to hang out with, don't forget to ask Jesus what he thinks about it. He will speak to your conscience. He will influence your character. He will help you to become the best version of yourself. Eventually, you will develop spiritual self-mastery and this will allow you to overcome sin. Take every thought to Jesus. Do the same thing with each sin. Take it to Jesus, bad memories, depressing feelings and all, and ask him to heal them. The devil wants to take your mind off God. He wants you to struggle with your problems on your own, apart from Jesus. He knows that Jesus is your strength. This is what I mean when I say that hard work and effort are required to renew your mind. Now, I'm well <laughs> I'm well aware that, uh, you know, th this is exactly the, the precise argumentation that they don't want any part of. Um, but it, it really is hard to dismiss how they can fall into the traps of only pure natural law theory, because obviously the devil can take hold of the process of rationalization, that he's he was the brilliant angel himself, right? And he's smarter than we are. Yeah. And, and that he, he, he can lay logical traps. And I'm just, that's, I'm curious, what are, in, in your experience, some of the logical, quote unquote, traps that have been presented in favor of these death bills? I didn't get here by myself. So it logically follows that, well, if I didn't uh, get here on my own, then I really philosophically don't have the right to take myself out. Yes. Uh, whether by assisted suicide or take somebody else out, whether uh, in the case of uh, abortion. Very good. So, uh, uh, so that, you know, that ultimately, it, it, it ultimately comes down to that. I don't have the right to end my own life because I didn't create it. Right. Whether you believe you were created by God or you just emerged out of the primordial soup, you know, you didn't, you didn't um, get here yourself. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking as you just spoke of, of the uh, the uh, excerpt from "It's a Wonderful Life." Uh, where the little the the, the guy is uh, witnessing uh, Clarence the angel coming <laughs> coming to George Bailey, and, uh, he, he, and 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 the angel was saying, "Well, he was going to commit suicide," and the guy sitting in the chair says, "Oh, that's a sin around here." <laughs> it was just a kind of not common sense, uh, logical deduction by simple people of simple faith. No, Doc, it's been a delight again, and we will continue with this natural law journey in future sessions and hit these issues hard because we can't let them go by the boards and have somebody, as we say, sneak something through on a Friday afternoon. On behalf of so many innocent 
We thank you for all the good work that you do for Massachusetts Citizens for Life and for all of us. From WQPH Radio 89.3 FM, we do salute you. God bless. Let your light shine. That is what it's all about here at WQPH Radio 89.3 FM. But we need to hear your story. You want your voice to be his voice. That is making the faith known to others. Please, my number is 877-625-3727. Tim Kilcoin, TalkCatholic.com. St. Mother Teresa told us, your ministry is your work right where you are. Grab on to this microphone. God bless.